Okay, so I started discussing uh, semi-classical methods in ordinary exponential integrals during last class. So, okay, let me tell you the plan. Okay, so first, um, so we are considering d equals zero dimensional case. There is no space time, just ordinary integral saddle point methods. The main emphasis of this thing is that uh, saddle point method or step descent method. Uh, the main point here is to show you that the method is not an approximation. It is actually something exact. Okay. Then I will go to today. I will overview what we did here quickly. And I will move to d equal one. So there will be a time, Euclidean time or Minkowski time, it doesn't matter. Quantum mechanics, this is pet integral in quantum mechanics, pet integral. And hopefully tomorrow I will move to d equal four QFT. Okay. But uh, at least in my opinion, this familiarity with the d equals zero example in its proper form is very important because, you know, um, at least in some literature, uh, for example, even if you look to uh, beautiful text of Coleman, it tells you that the saddles are of measure zero, you know, when you are doing integration. But if something is of measure zero, you shouldn't care about it, right? Uh, as an integration, uh, you know, as the weight in the integration. But I am telling you that it is actually measure one. So, th because the important thing is not the saddle itself, but the timbal associated, the cycle associated with the saddle. I hope that I am giving you a, a different perspective here, okay? So, even in, uh, you know, better discussion of this topic, you know, uh, it is always treated as, a, as an approximation, but I am telling you that at least in ordinary exponential integrals, or I am showing explicitly that it is not an approximation, it is an exact method, which has uh, lots of interesting structure. So as I said, today, I will overview what we did here quickly. Then I will move to quantum mechanics uh, and many, many nice examples in quantum mechanics. Then on the last day, I will move to four dimensional QFT. Instead of R4, I will compactify R4 to R3 times S1. And I will discuss the notion of adiabatic continuity and more properly formulated semi classics. So let me go back to our integral. For example, as an example, I gave two examples last class, but one of them was this exponential integral with this interval. Um, so it, we had two critical points, okay? So if you define this theta here, theta is argument of lambda. So as I said, there are two critical points, this, uh, Z0 and Z, Z0 and Z1. This is Z1, this is Z0. And the steepest descent cycles passing through this, it, when the argument of lambda is zero minus, you know, it comes out this way, goes this way, comes this way, okay? And goes this way. You see that actually, this piece cancels with that piece, this piece cancels with that piece. It is really a representation of this segment. O the only thing that contributes is the segment. But if you make argument of lambda slightly positive, then the steepest descent cycle jumps. This is the manifestation of Stokes phenomenon. And it goes up instead of having this structure, okay? And the linear composition, uh, the composition of the integration cycle to these timbals is like this. In one case, it is J0 plus J1 and J0 minus J1. So as you can see, there are two discontinuities in this story. 
the cycles are discontinuous because one of them is this, the other one is this, okay? And the coefficients are discontinuous. And what I am telling you is that these, con these discontinuities in the descriptions are there uh, to make the overall integral continuous as you cross argument of lambda equals zero. The function is analytic there actually. Now, let me tell you the relation between this geometric perspective and Borel resummation. In the Borel resummation, we expanded the integrand around some critical point here or there, and we applied this Borel procedure. Now, I am telling you that this cycle actually flips. The cycle flips as you change arguments of lambda. It is either this or that. And you can actually prove that if you do Borel resummation, if you do the integral over this versus that, these two integral differ in imaginary parts. So the real part is same, real part is coming from this segment, they are the same, but the imaginary part flips because the cycle is like this here and it is like this there, okay? The whole thing, the whole orientation is flipped. And interestingly, when we do Borel resummation, this is really the ambiguity that we describe. You know, you go around the singularity one way, or another way. So, so this gives us a nice geometric meaning to Borel analysis. Borel analysis, uh, you know, when you have this um, singularity in the Borel plane and you go around the singularity in the Borel plane, correspond to, you know, uh, Stokes phenomena. Uh, this is the reason that, uh, this is the reason that the result is twofold ambiguous. So this left-right Borel resummation is integration over the left shed symbols, you know, left or right, the appropriate left shed symbol. And this Borel ambiguity is the ambiguity in the choice of the cycle uh, on a Stokes line. Okay. So, so, so yes. Presumably the difference is just the contour uh, uh, circling that uh, point. Say that again. So the difference between the, the two versions is just the residue cir circle around the the, the um oh the yeah 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 the difference between these two will come this may be a cut so yeah the difference between them will be something like this this complicated yeah okay you have to do the whole thing yeah okay thanks yeah now uh, let me make everything more precise so if you do standard uh, perturbative analysis. So let's say this is for perturbative cycle. You get a series in coupling lambda. And as you can see, the numerator here is like n factorial square, roughly speaking. There's an n factorial here. The whole thing diverges as n factorial, as I said earlier. Then you do Borel sum, uh, Borel transform. It is this function. And it is some. Um, it's some special function here. It's not important what it is. And the Laplace transform is this thing. Now you can do Laplace transform. The following. This is related to the question that uh, Rich uh, is asking. So if you do this sum this way versus this way, the difference between these two is given by this Heinkel contour. So look to this formal series, do summation in one way and the other way. You can manipulate this kind of integration. And the final result is this. It tells you that the discontinuity in the Borel summation of the perturbation, perturbative series 
discontinuity in the Borelian summation of the perturbative series uh, or, or uh, is given by these non-perturbative factor and the series around the other saddle. This non-perturbative sector is associated with the other saddle in the problem. And this is the series around the other, uh, other saddle. So let us emphasize the punchline. So this punchline is very important and it carries over to PET integral in many interesting cases, um, as far as I know, in all the interesting cases. The discontinuity of the Borelli summation of the series, one of the series associated with this saddle is determined by only other saddle, other series associated by other saddles in the problem and nothing else. So this is the essence of resurgence. The set of all series around all saddles are closed under Stokes jumps. The Stokes jump of one is dictated by other saddles in the problem. So this is the this is the moral of the story. The, the Stokes jump is not something random. It is really the information about other other saddles in the problem. So here is the trans series, okay, for the partition function. There is perturbation theory, there is non-perturbative sector for this range of arguments of lambda cis theta for this range of argument of lambda. This is the trans series for the other range. This is the trans series, but we are interested at, for example, argument of lambda equals zero. Then at zero minus and zero plus, this is the decomposition of the cycles. Now, if you do this combination of Borel uh, and borel caldry summation, what's called borel caldry summation, you see that, for example, if you take the first representative here, Borel resummation of this thing gives some imaginary parts, but this part cancels with the with the um, with the contribution of the other saddle, and you obtain this result. And the point is, this result is exact. It is real, exact, unambiguous. Okay. And this is the realization of this phenomena. So the, in principle, we obtain some imaginary ambiguous part by doing some Borel resummation, but there is another contribution in the problem in the trans series like that. And, um, and the, these ambiguities cancel each other out and you obtain the, the uh, exact and real result. So I gave you two perspectives on this. One perspective is really some form of complex analysis, let me say analysis. And I also told you geometrically how and why this happens, okay? But now you can say, um, you can say this is just a simple exponential integral and everything is very explicit and there is cancellation of ambiguity and you can indeed obtain exact result from asymptotic analysis. Uh, but what if even if you go to quantum mechanics, you have infinitely many coupled integrals and in general, infinitely many critical points. What happens then? You, you can ask what happens in QFT, okay? Okay. Now, this is now starting for the uh, quantum mechanics. So I will describe some of these uh, techniques in the quantum mechanical example. So I, for example, either double well or periodic potential, okay. Is everything I said about the zero dimensional example fine? Uh, okay. So I will consider simple quantum mechanics with Lagrangian, you know, one half x dot square plus V of x. I parameterize my V of x as W prime square. 
the reason for that uh, will be clear from the next line. So this is some bosonic quantum mechanics, you know, just uh, regular quantum mechanics. I will also consider this very nice generalization of the quantum mechanics where you have a bosonic field and many Grassmann valued fields, okay? If it is only one Grassmann valued field, if NF is equal one, then this is supersymmetric quantum mechanics, which has some special properties. Interestingly, NF greater equal two are also special. They are related to something quasi exactly solvable system. Not that W of X is general. It can be anything. It can be uh, any function there. And it will turn out that uh, this is not very important for our, this is not important for our story, but is a side information and it's a fun fact. If exponential plus W or minus W is normalizable uh, function, so then the lowest NF states in these systems are exactly solvable. So these systems I am telling you the lowest NF states are exactly solvable if either of these things are uh, normalizable wave functions. So NF equal one is the supersymmetric case. And these systems, NF greater, greater equal to two are also very interesting. NF equal one received lots of attention in the past because it is supersymmetric quantum mechanics, but the others are also very interesting. Now, you notice that uh, there is only a time derivative acting on the Grassmann field. Because of that, you can actually uh, quantize the fermions easily and you can find a collection of Hamiltonians. For example, in supersymmetric quantum mechanics, you can find H plus minus here. And in this NF greater than one case, you also obtain a collection of Hamiltonian, Hamiltonians so you can write these Hamiltonians, so you can write this system as a sum over purely bosonic sectors with modified potential. So this was classical potential, this part is classical. And when you integrate out fermions, this is what you induce. This is quantum induced potentials, induced potentials potential. So this red curve here is the classical potential. And this black curve here, it is classical plus um, quantum modification, similarly on this picture here. Now, if you write down Lagrangian, uh, so there is a, again, classical Euclidean Lagrangian classical potential and quantum induced term. So in some sense, this, uh, uh, this tilting here is a one loop quantum effect. And I will describe both cases where zeta equals zero, there is no tilting, which is the bosonic case, which is a textbook case, but even in that case, uh, there will be some uh, new and very interesting um, statements that I will make concerning the completeness of the semi-classical analysis. Okay, so zeta equals zero is in some sense textbook example. Um, zeta, um, some other integers are also very interesting example. Zeta is in R is also interesting, but yeah. Let me start with uh, for example, double well quantum mechanics with this potential, okay? Perturbatively, there is a left, uh, you know, there is, uh, there is a left ground state and right ground state perturbatively. These are um, left and right well. But of course, non-perturbatively, we know that the ground state must be unique and parity even. So this thing here, is some nice wave function which looks like this. And this is anti-symmetric. Looks, it's a wave function which looks like this. And- Oh, hi, Mithat. Yeah. Hey, Mithat, this is Anosh. Uh, 
one question on the previous slide yes anosh uh, so uh, so here it's uh, you are saying that the tilting is a one loop quantum effect so do we know uh, what the effect would be once we include all the orders say non perturbative oh actually uh, this is one loop but it's actually exact um, okay higher, all higher no... corrections are zero yeah 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 because here actually you can uh, you know when you quantize the fermions so in the hamiltonian this will map this part uh, will disappear in the quantization there will be because there is no kinetic term and this part will give you this w double prime this operator psi i dagger psi i two times this minus one this is number operator so just this part so and this number operator will tell you the number of fermions in a given sector so it is um, so okay maybe there is a summation over i okay and yeah so this this formula is exact actually this decomposition is exact okay okay but uh, the statement is formal in the sense that this is the classical potential order uh, you know if i write in the uh, perturbative normalization, yeah, this would be order uh, g to zero. This is order g to one. So all I, my emphasis is that this is, uh, you know, one loop in g. It's higher order in g, or higher order in h bar, if you wish. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. 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 But at this stage, this is exact. Um, now, actually, if you consider perturbation theory on the left well or on the right well, it doesn't matter what it is. You can actually write down ground state h bar omega 2, you know, you form this series and not very surprisingly, this series a n is divert, uh, you know, uh, it grows factorially and the series is a divergent asymptotic series. So, and this, uh, this uh, degeneracy between left and right persists to all orders in standard perturbation theory. Of course, taking the tunneling into account, tunneling is just instant on effect, which I will describe momentarily. The parity even, parity plus, parity minus state is the real ground state of the system. And there is an energy gap between this parity odd state and parity even state. And this energy difference, delta E, is given by an instant on factor. Okay, this is standard textbook, uh, textbook result here. But I will, uh, I will tell you some new things about this system. Okay. So first, of course, I hope that all the students here are familiar with uh, instantons in, or tunneling phenomena, but instantons in the Euclidean pet integral formulation. So did I give formal definition? I, I gave a formal definition in a few pages, but pictorially, these are the configuration which goes from, uh, you know, you consider the, in the Euclidean setup, you consider the inverted potential and you consider configuration which starts on the left and goes to the right. In the Minkowski space, this corresponds to tunneling events um, uh, between left and right, okay? But these things, these instantons are actually saddle points of Euclidean pet integrals. And you can calculate the action associated with this instanton, and this is the instanton for our case. And you can tunnel back and forth, right? You can go this way, come back, go forward, come back, so on and so forth. And this thing, this instanton amplitude is in some sense the density of instantons, instantons, okay, here. So you can have this array of instanton, anti-instanton for this system. And for this system, an instanton must be followed by an anti-instanton and vice versa, okay? So 
So you have these uh, dilute instanton gas, and this thing is actually responsible uh, for the energy splitting. Um, energy splitting is this. And as I said earlier, when I was discussing ordinary integral, if you look to this expression, um, if you try to tailor expand this in G around zero, you will get zero plus zero plus zero, you know. So you learn that this is non-perturbative. It is not uh, expandable. You cannot expand it to a uh, perturbative series, okay? And, but I also told you that this thing, this perturbation theory around one of the wells is an asymptotic divergent series, okay? Okay, now, actually, if I, uh, let me see, if I, let's say I have this series uh, in perturbation theory, G square, and n equals zero to infinity. So if I work this out and look, uh, do you apply the same as the uh, the method of stocks? Do you, you know if I sketch error as I go to higher order, error gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay, this is the error, and there is this point where there is a least term truncation, least term truncation, and you if you look at there. Uh, just exactly as in our ordinary uh, integral discussion, there is an inherent error that you cannot overcome. And this error turns out to be exponential of minus one over three G squared. And remember that the energy gap, which was the instanton effect was exponential minus one over six uh, G squared. Okay, so clearly, Perturbation theory has some information about instantons, interestingly. And I will describe for you this in very uh, quantitative way. Now, first I want to put you put a reminder. <clears throat> if you look to standard textbook concerning instanton gas, you will see an <coughs> instant on, this is for periodic potential, okay? It doesn't matter, but for periodic potential, you can have an instant on followed by another instant on, another instant on, come back, come back. I am just following this pattern. Excuse me, just a second. This is the dilute instanton gas, okay? But more realistically, once in a while, you can have these correlated events and I will define them for you precisely, but they are. In these correlated events, an instanton is very close to another instanton and they have a characteristic size. Let me call this, this uh, you know, double instantons in some sense. They have a characteristic size and this characteristic size is much lesser than typical instanton separation. So in some sense, these are like uh, correlated events or if you are thinking in the, in StatMec, um, if you are thinking cluster expansion, expansion, these are one events in the cluster and these are two events. And there will be things like three events in the cluster expansion. This is really generalization of the cluster expansion in statistical mechanics to the system, okay? And there are all these kind of uh, configurations which you should consider as uh, higher clusters, two clusters, three clusters, so on and so forth. And the more realistic picture of the Euclidean vacuum is in terms of not only instantons, but these correlated events of instantons. 
And there is a important difference between what this thing correlated event is versus an uncorrelated instant on two instant on event. There is a difference between these two, okay? It's important. The summation over all of these events are taking care at leading order in semi-classics. This thing appears in second order in semi-classics. So when you are calculating this delta E, the contribution of these things appears at first order. The contribution of these things appears at second order, okay? This part is related to that part. This part is related to these parts, okay? So this distinction is important. Um, this distinction is rarely drawn in the, in the, in the standard textbooks in this uh, subject. Now, let me give a more formal discussion of the instant one, okay? So let us consider the classical uh, system with the classical potentials. So by using Bogomolny's factorization, you can write this, uh, uh, you know, this x dot square plus w prime square in this form. This part is perfect square greater or equal to zero. And when this is saturated, when this is equal to zero, this is called instant on equation. And the remainder here is an exact uh, total derivative. And the value is given by uh, W at these critical points. So if this is X1, X2, remember the potential was W prime of X square. So the action, instant on action is actually uh, roughly this. Uh, it's actually g squared times instant connection is this quantity here. Now, um, if I take w to be some periodic function, so instant on solution is this, this is standard, and this tau c is called a zero mode, you can put the center anywhere, okay, so the center can be here, or you can move it around, it doesn't matter. So this is called a zero mode, okay? This is the basics of instant on one. Now, if you want to write down instant on amplitude, the story I told you, this is the instant on factor, this thing coming from the zero mode uh, Jacobian. And you also have to consider fluctuations around the instant ons, okay? And so you have to calculate this fluctuation determinant. And uh, this is the counterpart of S double prime of X in our you know, at X critical X minus X critical square. In the ordinary integral, when you do expansion, Taylor expansion, there is an evaluation of S double prime it takes critical here. We have an action functional in QM. We have del square X, del X tau one, del X tau two kind of uh, second derivative and the fluctuation around it, del X tau one, del X tau two. This is the fluctuation operator. So you take second derivative of the potential and plug in the instant on solution. And the fluctuation operator is something very nice for this instant on. So it is this uh, nice potential. You can find the zero mode. It has an exact zero mode. And this hat in the determinant tells you that the zero mode must be removed. And then there is also perturbative expansion around the instant on. And I will not go in there. And the evaluation of this determinant requires something called uh, gelfand Yaglom method. It's not very easy, but it is a standard textbook material, so you can take a look at it, okay? Now, this gives us the whole instant on amplitude here, okay? But, I just want to tell you something interesting, actually. If you look at this system, somebody asked this question about triple well, 
during last class. For example, if you look at this system, there is clearly a classical configuration which goes from here to there or from here to there. So there are clearly instantons here. Instantons of this form are present. Here is a question. Do they contribute to the energy at order exponential s instanton? Does anybody know the answer to this question? It's a trick question. Actually, oddly enough, this is an exact solution, okay? Exact solution. But the contribution of this to, for example, energy is zero due to instantons, here is zero. It doesn't give any contribution because if you look at the details of the system, if you find the counterpart of this fluctuation operator, fluctuation operator minus t square tau square plus v double prime x instanton. This is, what did I call it? M instanton, which is fluctuation operator. If you look at this potential, it's a potential like this. And you can evaluate these determinants and determinant in this case, determinant at is actually infinity. So the instanton factor actually gives you this instanton amplitude as a coefficient here, and this coefficient is zero because this is determinant to power minus one half. So important, having instanton does not mean that they will contribute it you know, at the instant on order. Actually, in this problem, there is a contribution to the spectrum. For example, this state and this state here, the, the, they are degenerate perturbatively, okay? And they, the degeneracy will be lifted up, you know, non-perturbatively, but this non-perturbative factor is exponential minus two s instant on. It's not an instant on effect. It's a two instant on effect. A correlated, uh, not too uncorrelated instanton. It is this, uh, in some sense, uh, two events, II kind of event um, that contributes. But it orders, it instanton orders, it, the coefficient at the instanton level is zero. So having an instanton does not mean that there will be a contribution of order exponential minus s instanton to the partition function, okay? I hope this is clear because honestly, this case is never discussed in textbook. You, you not in textbook, but it is the generic case. So it is like a uh, lamppost effect, you know, uh, uh, in the standard double well, instant on contributes, we know what to do with them. And, you know, and we give that as the canonical example. But if you take some generic uh, polynomial potential, the standard instant on contribution will be zero. And it comes from this fluctuation operator, determinant of the fluctuation operator being infinite. Okay. But I will not go to the details of this, but I wanted to give you a larger perspective on things. So I wanted to mention this. And at higher order, as I said, at order exponential to a instant on, there will be tunnelings like this, which contributes. There are also tunneling which goes there and comes back, which contributes to the spectrum. But this thing here, it does not contribute, okay? Now, um, this is the at least uh, qualitative story. Now, if you want to do perturbation theory in QM, in textbooks in you know undergraduate, we learn Israeli Schrodinger perturbation theory. 
Um, and this is not a very efficient way to implement perturbation theory. You know, we never do, you know, we do first order, second order in standard textbooks, in quantum mechanics, introductory quantum mechanics. Rarely you will find something about third order, but you know, uh, the, 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 the general case is not, uh, a gen a general order is not discussed. There is another implementation of perturbation theory this is uh, due to Carl Wender and Wu, and it dates back to 69. They did the quartic, uh, this double weld potential, okay? Uh, but uh, fairly recently, uh, you know, uh, Tim Suleiman Pasic uh, generalized this method to general polynomial potentials. And that part is easy, but he implemented a mathematical package uh, which allows analytic computation of the perturbation theory in these quantum mechanical systems at arbitrary order, if you wish. You know, um, something like uh, hundred order can be obtained analytically. It is symbolic calculation. So it is really not numerical, not numerical. Equal. If you put parameters in the potential, you will obtain a perturbative series as a coefficient, a perturbative series as a function of the parameters, okay? Um, so uh, obtaining a hundred orders, it's like two minutes or one minute of order few minutes. Um, if you want uh, 500 orders, it takes a couple hours. Um, okay, so let us look to how perturbation theory behaves. Now perturbation theory here, it is written as a function of coupling and level number. This M plus one half is something that you are all familiar with. It is N plus one half H bar omega, but we set H bar in omega to one. And these are corrections to it, okay? And this term and this term, you can give it as a homework question in quantum mechanics, but not this term. But the mathematical package gives you arbitrary order here, this mathematical package. Uh, you can obtain it, it's publicly available. Um, uh, it gives you this uh, structure of the perturbation theory. And for level N, if you look how the large order terms behave, you see that it actually diverges as M plus two N factorial. So this is large order uh, factorial growth. Let's take level number zero. This is the ground state. It diverges as M factorial, but the coefficient is given in terms of instanton data. And there are these uh, N minus one factorial, you know, canceling here, N minus two factorial subleading uh, things here. Okay. Now, okay, so it is divergent and asymptotic. Can we make sense out of this? Well, in this system, for example, for this periodic system, there are instantons followed by instantons and instantons followed by anti-instantons. Okay, let me use this color. This is instanton followed by anti-instantons. Of course, if this tau is in R, these things are not exact solution. And the way to see this is that if you plug in these things into the action as uh, x i i kind of thing, you obtain two times instant on action. And for instant on instant on, you obtain a potential which is like this, which looks like repulsive. And for instant on anti instant on, you obtain a potential which looks like this, which is attractive. But these words, repulsive and attractive, are just 
inheritance from old literature. They caused too much confusion in the past. And it just means that these combinations are not exact solution at any finite separation if tau is in R, uh, if it is infinite Euclidean space. So this tau direction um, is called uh, quasi zero mode direction, tau one two direction, okay? Okay. Uh, let me actually go forward and come back. Now, let us compactify R to S1 beta, okay? So we will consider uh, Euclidean time in S1 beta, okay? Actually, we will study semi-classical expansion, and I told you it's actually a cluster expansion. And in the semi-classical expansion, so the instant on summation is something like this. You know, uh, this is the instant on factor, C is like exponential s instant on. But this thing is actually interesting, this kind of integral. Uh, you may have seen in StatMec, uh, for example, it is discussed in Landau and Lifshitz and other places too. Standard text in uh, StatMec discusses this. Um, and there are integrals like that. So in this part, for example, there are contributions, uh, you know, if you sum over, for example, if you ignore all the interactions here, okay, you will generate, uh, this thing will give you beta, this thing will give you beta square. So you will generate one plus C beta plus C square beta square divided by two factorial and C cube beta cube divided by three factorial, so on and so forth. So it will be exponential C. So, and this is exponential of the instanton factor, okay? So this is so-called dilute instant on gas. If you sum, if you ignore all the interactions, V i j equals zero, or we want to uh, in interaction set to zero. However, if you keep the interactions here, this integral gives something of order beta square, but it also gives something of order beta. The thing which is sub-extensive in beta here is the contribution of i i. And you have to take such events and sum over them. And there are contributions like that to the energy observable. I, I square, I bar square, I, I bar. And these are correlated events. These are different from, for example, something like uncorrelated events, which are already taken into account in the dilute gas approximation, okay? So this thing, these higher order terms here are the, uh, you know, in some sense, these uh, two events, three events and stuff like that. Okay. This thing here is coming from the proliferation of the instanton. This thing is coming from proliferation of the anti-instanton. Doesn't matter. And this term here is coming, or this term here is coming from proliferation of the instant on anti-instant on events, okay? Now, now let me make this instant on anti-instant on more precise. Let's consider tau is on S1 beta, okay? If you put an i and i bar here, they will interact. Let's say this is tau. The other direction is beta minus tau. Actually, you will show something very interesting. You will show that when you regularize the setup to a circle, okay, the interaction between two instant one is two terms. And, but the interesting thing is that you may immediately realize this thing is a critical point. Either it, when it is repulsive or attractive, it doesn't matter. When one of the one of the things on the North Pole, the other is in the South Pole, on this uh, base space, this is a critical point. It can, be, uh, it can be repulsive or attractive, 
uh, you know, the, uh, the character of the critical point may be different. I will make that precise. But if you want to find the contribution of these uh, two events, correlated two events, you have to do this integral over zero to beta of this thing, subtract of the contribution of the uncorrelated events. You could have kept it and you would have obtained something of order beta square plus order beta. And this sub-extensive part would correspond to ii bar and uh, extensive part would be co corresponding to i and i bar independent events contribution. Now, actually, once you are given such an exponential integral, you can determine um, steepest descent cycle. So if it is exponential of minus a over g, steepest descent cycle, let me go look at here. Steepest descent cycle, this is tau star equal beta over q. Tau star mu of tau, beta over two. So in this case, steepest descent cycle in one case is this one, okay? In the other case, when it is exponential plus a over g v of tau, steepest descent cycle is this. So it wants to go to this direction. So now, this is the difference in interpretation compared to all literature. You used to think that this tau is some sort of separation between instanton and anti-instanton. But however, when we go to semi-classics, this separation is no longer interpreted as a real quantity, it is complex. And you see that actually, despite the fact that tau star is real, it's the steepest descent cycle lives in the complex plane. The steepest descent cycle can be this. It can actually also be this, depending on the argument of G here, okay? So in this case, there is no problem. You can do this integral very easily. In this case, there is something interesting. So as I said, this is the case of instant on instant on correlated event. There is nothing interesting, uh, you know, not much interesting. But if you look to instant on anti instant on correlated event, first of all, the amplitude is not only the product of i and i bar, there is this log one over g enhancement of it. But more importantly, the outcome is twofold ambiguous. Now, this is interesting because we are dealing with a, a quantum mechanical system which has no instabilities, but you see that the instanton anti instanton contribution, if you do it correctly, it is twofold ambiguous. Ambiguous. You may think that this is a disaster because you know it tells you that semi-classical, semi-classics, you know at least instanton approximation is void of meaning. You know because you are calculating something real and it's giving you something which has some imaginary part. Furthermore, the imaginary part is twofold ambiguous. And if you write this expression, it goes like that. But remember the perturbation theory around perturbative vacuum. We did this several pages ago, and I put it here. And these were the coefficients here with these instant home factors. And here is the magic. Okay. If you take imaginary part of Borel resummation of perturbation theory. There should be perturbation theory here, okay? Perturbation theory. And if you take imaginary part of this ii bar, these two things cancel, exactly. So you see that the combination 
of perturbation theory plus second order semi-classics classics is meaningful and free of any ambiguities up to order of exponential of 4s instant on okay actually this thing um, this cancellation at this leading order was realized in old work of Pogomolny as you stand and about 10 years ago uh, Gerald with Gerald Tan we made this structure much more precise and we showed uh, these subleading uh, corrections, which tells you that this statement is not only some leading order statement, but it's an exact statement. Okay. Now, this is the uh, discussion of the bosonic system. Now, let us look to supersymmetry, quasi exact solvable systems, and in between. And here things get even more interesting. Um, well, uh, there is this quantum tilting, as I said earlier. Now the interaction between an instanton and, and another instanton, it has this classical part, but because of the fermion zero mode, there is this uh, fermion zero mode induced term this thing is also present when we have fermions in quantum field theory. This structure mimics uh, this mimics QFT. There is always some classical interaction, classical interaction plus uh, quantum interaction interaction due to fermions. Um, this structure emerges in any, more or less in any QFT uh, with fermions uh, in, in, in higher dimensions. So the fermion effect is encoded in this zeta tau, okay? Now the bizarre thing is following. So the classical part is this, okay? So the, uh, I, I was supposed to say some words a few pages ago. I told you that the critical point here is that tau equal beta over two, tau star equal beta over two. Not that as beta goes to infinity, this critical point goes to infinity because of that. And this is when the interaction becomes zero. This is called critical point at infinity. And it has some interesting features and they manifest themselves best in these systems. So any questions there? Now, if you look to, I think this part is for II, correlated event, the II integral is this. Here is the interesting thing. Normally Gaussian critical points if you have a critical point and it's a Gaussian critical point, okay, it gives the most dominant contribution around that critical point. But these things, critical point at infinity are different and they are more generic than Gaussian critical points in quantum mechanics and in QFT. If you look to contribution of the critical point at infinity in the beta goes to infinity limits, you see that the contribution actually because of the integrand goes to zero. And here the steepest descent cycle for II is this cycle. And you can do this integral easily. And it, it's really an easy integral to do and you obtain this result. But for the II bar, II bar, again, critical point is here, but the steepest descent cycle is this. It's very interesting. This is the, or let me use some, something, something like this. This is the steepest descent cycle, okay? And if you do the integral over there, the result turns out to be generically um, 
twofold ambiguous except for zeta n integer for zeta non integer it's question. only go ahead what is zeta zeta was the parameter in the hamiltonian in the lagrangian So when I integrated out the fermions, I obtained a collection of the Lagrangians. For example, in the supersymmetric case, zeta is plus minus one. This is uh, Suzy QM. You obtain W prime square plus minus H bar W double prime. Okay. So this h bar h bar has a zeta. You can put a zeta instead of plus minus. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks. Yeah. So what I am telling you that in these systems, in these Lagrangians, if zeta is not is not uh, an integer, there is an ambiguity in an i i bar. When zeta is an integer, it disappears, and there is a very good reason for it. For example, in supersymmetric quantum mechanics. Ground state energy is zero to all orders in perturbation theory, and it has no ambiguity. And indeed, this if you put zeta equal one, the ambiguity of i i bar also cancels, and whatever you are left with is just this phase. And this phase is very important to get the correct results. Um, but uh, still, there is a there is a another version of resurgence there which is taking place. But yeah. Uh, I will come back to that momentarily. So, if you do the integration over this cycle, or you can also take, you know, it depends on your choice. There is another cycle like that. On that cycle, you get these twofold ambiguous results. Okay. Um, so, I think I can skip few of these things, or should I? So maybe I should say one more thing. Actually, here I describe critical point at infinity. And if you look to these cycles, the contribution comes not from the critical point, okay? Not from these critical points, but it comes from somewhere on the cycle. In this case, it comes from here. In this case, it comes from here. But remember the potential was, it is a, classical parts and it has a quantum induced part if you take if you take this potential which is a quantum modified potential and solve for equations of motions but not standard newton's equation standard newton's equation in this system would be this but sim classics tells you that you have to complexify everything make x of power into z of power. Actually in real setup, there is no solution in this case, uh, uh, in, in one of these, in this case, but uh, in this case, there is no solution, but in the context fight setup, there's a solution. So if you solve these systems with these quantum modified potentials, you obtain some solutions. These are called real and complex bion. I will show you there, real and complex bion. These are these bions. These are molecular events that I mentioned. And these things are the most dominant configuration on these cycles. So there are two different ways, ways to obtain the same result. You either use this critical point at infinity concept and you know do integral over this quasi zero mode direction or you use this uh, uh, quantum modified potential and write down the complexified equations of motions and write down its solutions these are these solutions the two give exactly the same results okay actually i will show you the picture but in a moment let me see okay So, okay, is a complex bion. Ah, okay. For example, in this setup, let me show a picture, then go back. This black part here is the real part of the solution, which starts here 
and goes to this critical point, bounces from context critical point and turns back. And this red part is the imaginary part of the solution. So there is a real part of V, an imaginary part of V. This is the solution. So you obtain uh, interesting looking solutions like that. Okay. Um, is this, maybe I should make one more remark and I will come back to this. So real thing goes from here to there. Again, pictorially, this is real thing. It is all nice and you, it is in the real domain. But the thing which goes from here to complex turning point and bounces back, it looks almost like a step function and it looks singular, but it is still finite action. And uh, they, they, these are quite interesting configuration. You see that some configuration which is complex, almost discontinuous and which has almost singular structure can be completely finite action and contributes to the pet integrals, okay? Maybe I will come back to that momentarily. Oh, uh, maybe I have five minutes or so, uh, okay. So this thing I can go over quickly. When you put this zeta here, okay, um, you can write down perturbation theory, uh, you know, as a function of G, but the coefficient will depend on level number and zeta. Zeta equal one is the Suzy case. If you put zeta equal one here, n equal zero, zeta equal one, everything here must vanish. Put n equal zero here, one half minus one half zero. Here, if you put here minus two plus two plus one, uh, what does it make plus one? Oh, n is equal zero, I'm sorry. N is equal zero, it's, this part is minus one. And this part is one times zeta for zeta equal one, this term vanishes. You see n equals zero, zeta equal one, all of the terms here are zero. So this is supersymmetric case. But when you deform it from zeta equal one, um, from zeta equal one to some other zeta, there is a divergent asymptotic series here where the coefficients here are polynomials of n and zeta. Okay, zeta, zeta squared, zeta cube. And you can study large order structure of the perturbation theory. There is this m factorial growth. There are there is this structure, some um, function, B0, B1, B2, et cetera, which depends on this parameter zeta. So now I am capturing many theories at once. Zeta equal zero is the bosonic theory, zeta equal one is supersymmetric theory, zeta equal two is quasi exactly solvable system, and arbitrary zeta in between is something else, okay? And I am capturing all of them. All of them have a divergent asymptotic expansion. But if you look at zeta equal one here, for example, the coefficient has this factor one over gamma one minus zeta, which is for zeta equal one, it will be gamma zero, which will be zero. So you see that for supersymmetric case, this dies off, the coefficient dies off, but uh, you know, as it approaches, these terms are still non-trivial. So these P's are some non-trivial functions and you can go ahead and calculate uh, contribution to non-perturbative contributions to ground state energy. You can actually show that around this real bion and complex bion, there are fluctuations and these fluctuations are determined by these polynomials as a function of zeta, okay? And you derive this beautiful formula again, ambiguous part of perturbation theory for arbitrary zeta, now all this class of theories, and this complex bion contribution, which is twofold ambiguous, they cancel each other out, okay? And you obtain meaningful unambiguous results.
Um, let me skip this. It's not important. I just want to say something about supersymmetric theory. For example, in supersymmetric theory, uh, ground state energy, um, E ground state, is positive definite, must be positive definite. It is zero if Suzy unbroken. It is positive if Suzy is broken, okay? So double well example is an example in which Suzy is uh, broken, okay? But on the other hand, at least in the old literature, this was a long standing puzzle. The, the, in the old literature, people believe that the contribution of the instantons always lowers the energy. But this is not true. If it were to lower the energy, you would get something lesser than zero and it would be inconsistent with supersymmetry. If you look to this complex bion solution, okay, here, let me go back. Um, the complex bion solution just here, there is this phase factor, exponential i pi. So the non-perturbative contribution comes out to be non-perturbative minus exponential to s instant on exponential plus minus i pi. This part coming from the fact that the configuration is complex. So, and it cancels this minus, minus times minus is plus. So it leads to the positivity. So this is how consistency, consistency with supersymmetry algebra is achieved. And it comes from the complex nature. This periodic potential, uh, in this case, uh, Suzy is not broken, not broken. So ground state energy must be zero. And interestingly, oops, okay, there are two contributions, one of them coming from this real bion, and it would reduce the ground state energy. The other one coming from this complex bion. Let me show you the formula here. Sorry about that. If you look to some of these two here, zeta equal one case is Suzy case. You get minus one from the real bion minus exponential uh, pi from the complex bion. So the sum of these two is zero. So it tells you that the, even in this, uh, in this case of, uh, you know, periodic supersymmetric case, there are still instanton contributing to the observables. And in this case, this real bion and complex bion contributing to the observables, but their sum adds up to zero. And, and this is again consistent uh, with the supersymmetry algebra. But if you look to old literature, um, Actually, this kind of configuration, uh, you know, according to old wisdom, this kind of configuration, which is honestly, if you look at it, it is like this real part is like step function and the imaginary part becomes like that, should not contribute. But it does because the kinetic term is Z dot square, which is, you know, x dot square minus y dot square plus two i x dot y dot, okay? So you can have some something which looks singular or pathological in x or y, but since kinetic term has this, uh, you know, has this structure, this thing is actually well-defined. It has finite action, same action as this real bion, and it contributes to the observable. Okay, so I think this is almost all I want to say about these cancellations in, the, in this quantum mechanical case. It renders the quantum mechanical 
had integral meaningful. And this is the last slide. I want to say something about it. And it gives you some large order perturbation theory relation to low orders of fluctuations around some saddles, which looks like critical point at infinity. And this thing, the story I told you is sort of traditional uh, form of resurgence, surgeons. But there is one more thing which is very intriguing. I told you that around instant on, there are perturbative fluctuations as a function of level number, coupling, zeta, it doesn't matter, okay? As instant on. And around these bions, real or complex bion, there are again these perturbative fluctuations. And it turns out that if you know perturbation theory around perturbative vacuum up to order, for example, G to the something M, there is a very simple formula which tells you the whole perturbation theory around, uh, around instant on fluctuation. So this is a constructive, constructive form of resurgence, surgence. If you know the first 10 order in perturbation theory, you obtain the first 10 order in uh, perturbation theory around the instanton. Um, so this is uh, derived in a paper with Gerald Dunn in 2014, I believe, okay? Uh, for, for example, uh, periodic potential, potential. And it's a quite non-trivial relation because calculating this fluctuation around instanton with standard methods, for example, Feynman methods. You know, after our paper, some people calculated it by Feynman methods and they agree up to order, they were able to check only up, up to order G to the four or something like that, but it took them like six, seven months, months of work. Um, and using computer and numerical tools. So there is this very uh, interesting relation. It tells you that if you know perturbation theory around perturbative vacuum, there is this one line formula, which tells you perturbation theory around instant on fluctuations or bion fluctuations, it doesn't matter. This is a new form of resurgence. This part of the story is not, uh, is not yet, this is only, uh, is not yet generalized to generalized, not generalized fully, fully. The potentials that Gerald and I showed were all, if you look to energy conservation relation, P squared plus P of X, let us replace P with Y, okay? So it becomes Y squared is equal E minus VX. This thing for the systems we, we were able to solve are all genus one curves, genus one complex curve. The systems, the classical systems that we were able to show this formula. But the generalization of this result to higher genus curves is not yet known. Higher genus is an open question. Open question. Okay, so let me stop here. Any any questions about the about the traditional resurgence here or uh, or this new form? Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions right now in the audience? Uh, I have a, a very basic question. Not uh, when you discussed the double well potential, uh, you mentioned that the ground state is doubly degenerate. Uh, but then, like, it's a one-dimensional potential and it's well behaved. So, shouldn't it have any degeneracy? Like, it should not have any degeneracy, right? In of course, mechanics. it is lifted. Uh, 
it is doubly degenerate to all orders in perturbation theory. Okay. So it is doubly degenerate to all orders in perturbation theory, left and right. So, but the degeneracy is lifted and true ground state is this parity even state. And the higher state is parity odd state, but that splitting is an instant on effect. So this is the ground state wave function here, okay? And it is unique, ground state is unique. And first excited state is this, it has only one node. And the energy splitting there is given by, uh, by an instant one effect. So only when we consider the tunneling event, uh, it's the, the degenerate is, is lifted, right? But uh, exactly, just, exactly, exactly. Uh, just, only just the, during the Schrodinger equation, yeah. there will be some degeneracy is what you're saying. No, in, if you solve Schrodinger equation, honestly, yes. okay. Yes. From there as well, uh, you will get this solution. Let's say you solved it numerically, Correct. you will get this thing. So Schrodinger equation has the same data about uh, has the same data about the um, has the data about the instantons or okay. WKB methods. You can also do with WKB, right? Okay. Okay. You can write down WKB wave function, which has this uh, uh, P of X prime, the X prime up to X. So let's say this is WKB, KB wave function. By the way, I didn't talk about it, but WKB method is also not an approximation. The properly done version of the WKB method also involves the Stokes phenomena, WKB wave functions and exact information can be obtained from it. But even if you know the naive WKB wave function, okay, which is something like this. And if you look to the WKB wave function, WKB at the midpoint here, X mid, it will give you uh, exponential of S instant one. So there is a way to connect WKB data with the instanton data. But yeah, but if you consider the system to all orders in perturbation theory, you can never uh, lift up this degeneracy. They are degenerate up to infinite order in perturbation theory. This lifting is something non-perturbative. Right, uh, also maybe a very naive question, but uh, you're saying that so whatever analysis that we are doing, like uh, since the last lecture, so that gives you exact results, but then like, uh, I mean, these are not convergence, right? There are convergence issues with uh, such asymptotic series and- Yeah, of course they are uh, not convergence. Yeah. So like but, as formally they are exact, is it what you are trying to say? Uh, they are not convergent, but when you do Borel resummation- Yes. And Laplace integral, you get finite results from these formal series. I see. So you get finite results, but finite results also look pathological. And, and, and these are not just asymptotic analysis, is it? Like, I mean, it's- a the, very... This is, uh, the, you can call this complex asymptotic analysis or, or all order asymptotic analysis. This is data you obtain from the asymptotic analysis, but it is an exact data about the mm -hmm. system. And you can, you can, the beauty of this thing is that you can go from that divergent asymptotic series to exact things. So if you, if you go back to the previous lecture, for example, I told you this is a formal series, right? Yes. And it has some, uh, you know, you can do left and right summation of it. And it has some discontinuity. Okay, it has a jump, but this, this discontinuity is given by the other saddle and the fluctuation around it. So all of these things form a closed set. And when you are considering something physical like the integral in this interval, for example, you know, combination of these two, the result is not ambiguous. There is no infinity. Yes. It is the final, final physical result. This result is the is some Bessel function of something. This integral is some Bessel of some sort. 
Okay, so it tells you that the thing that we call asymptotic analysis, approximation, etc., if you do it exactly, actually has information about the exact results, and in some, in many, in some cases, you can translate those things to exact results. And uh, are there any like uh, well-known limitations of this uh, method, like this summability results? Uh, maybe we um, continue. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, Mithat, are you going to be around? We will have a discussion session in. Uh, I can minutes. be here in. Ah, uh, okay, uh, great. So, so let's continue uh, during the discussion session. In how many minutes? Uh, fifteen minutes. One in five. 15. Okay, I will be back in 15 minutes. Uh, uh, okay. So we, we are having a tea break here. So we will come okay. back. Soon. I will also have tea. So uh, have fun. Okay, okay, great. Yeah. So let's all thank Mithat again. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>